architecture, urbanism, but also old buildings and the whole cityscape change over time. Some urbanist principles don't seem that ideal anymore, and buildings that are standing already inevitably need some care. But what about the people in charge or the overall ruling system? How is it going to deal with that? Is it even going to allow any change? In other words, how did cities look and what was the architecture and urbanism during the very end of the communist rule in Central Europe of the 1980s? Let's talk about the start of postmodernism. What exactly it even means, how is it different from modernism, and how was it applied over here compared to the capitalist West? Postmodernism is not just related to buildings, but maybe even more importantly to urbanism. So let's talk about that too. And inevitably, we have to take a look at how the existing city looked, since standing buildings don't just look and work indefinitely. Someone needs to take care of them every once in a while, which wasn't exactly a priority in the entire post-war time period. So let's talk about the topic of urban decay. In our city of Altengrad, we will do three projects today. We will redevelop a very old place with current urbanism and a radio building. Next, we are going to tear down very old city blocks and replace them with the only thing that was available, the panel blocks. And lastly, we will build a television tower. Let's go. Projects here in the time-lapse might not be the best examples of postmodernism. It might actually be somewhat difficult to talk about it in the Eastern Bloc of the 1980s because a lot of structures built in this time period were planned long before. Countries, due to the economic struggles, simply didn't build as much as before. And there was a surprising ideological problem with postmodernism. But perhaps all of this combined might be a great introduction to the 1980s architecture. It simply wasn't simple. What I'm building over here is the Slovak radio headquarters. It is a great example of a highly technical looking structure, although it is a very much a 1960s design. The building took a very long time to finally enter construction in the 1970s, and it was completed in 1983 so far from 1980s architecture, although a certainly great example of not everything done in the 80s must be 80s design. And I would say that was probably the majority of buildings finished, although there are examples of even late 1980s buildings clearly being much earlier designs, like the Hotel Forum in Krakow, Poland, built between 79 and 89, a whole decade under construction while planning, of course, took a few years prior to that. Overall, it's hard to find proper big postmodern projects in this time period. The very large projects in the 80s more often than not included more politically exposed things, as those would receive funding more easily in centrally controlled economy, and there applying some progressive postmodern approach was not exactly wanted, as I will later explain. One example for all is the Congress Center and Hotel Forum, today Corinthia, in Prague, finished in 81 and 88 respectively, where the communist elites practically built for themselves very expensive place to talk politics, while the country around them was not doing so great. No, the evolution of architecture is much clearer on smaller buildings, and especially in urbanism which actually went hand in hand, as we will see, and as you can already see here in the time-lapse with the residential blocks of flats that I'm not really placing in the usual way as before. But first, it's probably best to talk some theory. What actually is postmodern architecture? How is it different from modernism? The post-Second World War modernism heavily worked with the entire technological development and the perceived need to build better, perhaps even a utopian world, especially in the Eastern Bloc and especially further east. I could simply recite the typical characteristics, so form follows function, so buildings should look like the purpose they have, the looks should be influenced by materials, so if it's made of concrete, show it, don't hide thick walls, pillars, beams, and so on, don't hide the industrial repeating aesthetic. This logically means removal of decorations or applying simple lines and simple shapes. 
Modernism, for example, completely ditches gable roofs, arches, and similar, superseded, quotation marks, geometries. It is no coincidence that modernist architecture, and especially for ordinary buildings, residential, commercial, or amenities, was very easily accepted in the Eastern Bloc because it did fit the political narratives of equality, centralized production, industrialized production, and only looking forward, building a better, cleaner, happier world. This also meant that the entire modernist thinking disregarded older architecture and therefore existing parts of cities. This will be very important later. This was just a neutral and criminally brief summary of modernism. I already talked about it and its various branching ideas basically throughout the whole post-war part of this series, so I will not condense all of that in here. Postmodernism in architecture, in a nutshell, is described like a rebellious reaction to modernism. So, in a way, questioning its principles, questioning why did modernism ditch the old architecture, why does it insist on highly functional forms, and was modernism even correct in its assumptions for human needs? Was it even realistic to achieve all of that? Maybe you can already kind of feel that questioning the established ideas probably won't do well under the authoritarian communist leadership, especially the questioning of the ability to create some perfect world in the future through the chosen architectural trends. So, there is some potential ideological clash, therefore postmodernism did not establish itself as fast as in the West, and certainly not as strongly, but rather very carefully, sneakily. The Western postmodernism, which was already going strong, had very strong emphasis on returning to more classical architecture, the so-called quotation principle, quoting the old styles, borrowing certain elements from them. Actually, a very good example of that are all the over-the-top hotels and casinos in Las Vegas, in United States. They are obviously not real pyramids and castles and ancient temples, but just borrowing those elements into their architecture. Although similar examples can be found on much more grounded postmodern structures, like in New York, the 550 Madison Avenue building. It's a very uniform looking structure with its window geometry, but the top almost resembles some Greek temple, while the entrance has a huge arch, like a castle gate, plus the whole thing uses a stone pattern facade. This usage of classical elements is perhaps one branch of postmodernism, probably more typical of its earlier days. The next branch is probably what most of you associate with postmodernism, and that is just the weirdness, the what the heck is that, you know? The combination of other postmodernist ideas, like combining seemingly uncombinable materials, colors, shapes, adding complexity, forcing asymmetry, and so on and so on. Maybe kind of do whatever you want approach. Those old modernists will not stop you now. I'm probably making postmodernists angry right now, but I'm just trying to introduce the difference. This second branch is more typical for the 1990s, even in the West, so let's give it more attention later. Anyways, this second branch was completely out of the question in the Eastern Bloc. The ironically conservative officials who controlled things and the local architectural community would not allow it. Although some of the principles did make it, as we will see. The first branch, however, some return to older architecture, that did make its way into the Eastern Bloc, but mostly only for smaller projects, like I said earlier, individual building changes, and most importantly, in urbanism. But this is where the clash of ideologies happened, because in the earlier days of communist takeover and post-war rebuilding, the pre-war architecture and urbanism were heavily criticized by the communists and aligned architects, throwing around phrases such as evil capitalist expansions, chaotic, unsystematic approach, elitism, greed, and so on and so on. Basically taking the modernist urbanism arguments for better cities and adding politics to them wherever possible. 
clearly switching from this narrative would be very, very hard. I will mention one example later. The switch eventually did start to happen, but it happened very carefully and somewhat hand in hand with the overall societal changes in the mid to late 1980s due to the communist reforms allowed by the Soviet Union. Let's take a look at one building from Prague, which is sometimes mentioned as the first Czechoslovak postmodernist project. No surprise, it is rather small and it was the headquarters of a state company, so in a way, favorable conditions for trying something new. Architecturally, notice the big clock on top in the rounded housing. It almost looks like something from old train stations. So there is that borrowing of older elements. The clock is positioned very asymmetrically. The building overall has many asymmetric geometries with windows, entrances, the top overhang and so on. But perhaps most importantly, Look how the building fits with its neighbors. That is something quite rare. The design does not force its way in that block. It respects the existing buildings. It's not much higher, it's not much bigger, and it's exactly aligned with the street line. That is one very important sudden aspect of postmodernist approach of the era, not dismissing the old architecture anymore. It is no secret that there were various plans for heavy demolitions of cities by many modernist architects. Big parts of Warsaw were not rebuilt into its former look after the Second World War, even tearing down functional buildings. Le Corbusier in France, perhaps just to make waves, proposed the total rework of Paris's downtown. Some Czech architects wanted demolitions of entire 19th century Prague districts. Partially, that political narrative played a role, that the previous city expansions were just bad, now we know better, but there was just that strong idea to start fresh with our new abilities. Modernist buildings, therefore, very rarely respected their surroundings, because the old buildings around probably won't be there anymore, so why respect them? This mindset inevitably led to quite drastic urban decay, of course, not just because of modernist thinking, but because of the whole system. Housing was nationalized, so state had to finance maintenance, which it largely didn't because it rather financed new construction on the outskirts. Plus, the construction industry completely moved away from being even able to conduct old building maintenance on some reasonable scale. Even many historical landmarks suffered in this time period, partially also because they were remnants of the politically unacceptable systems. The postmodernist thinking was different, mostly due to the ever-present physical evidence that things are just not working. The inner cities look horrible, people don't want to spend their time there, there is heavy traffic and so on, and the modernist utopia on the outskirts in the panel blocks of flats clearly did not happen. States were unable to fully equip the new districts, to fully connect them with public transport as originally planned. Urbanistically, they lacked in some ways. So how about we shift our focus back to the inner cities? And how about we learn something from them? Don't just dismiss them as the evil past. And, you know, very pragmatically, we simply don't have money to completely raise the old cities to the ground, so we have to make them work anyway. Thus, planners started to think more in terms of classical urbanism, so establishing city squares, actual places where people can go, hang out with their community, do some shopping, visit amenities, and classic city streets, not just soulless roads functionally divided from the rest of the area and big parking lots, but actual mixed streets with city life. This urbanism started to be applied even for the new estates for the late 1980s, so organizing buildings more into classic blocks, with less space in front, but creating the inner yards. Overall building shorter and more compact. There was also one very practical point to convince the more conservative planners. Space in the outskirts simply ran out. Directions where new estates can be built were almost exhausted, so it was actually very pragmatic to return to inner cities and find space there. And there was a lot of it, especially in cities that did not yet fix all the war damage, or rather did not rebuild into the pre-war state. 
So, a lot of German cities. I already showed it, but there are so many examples from 1980s East Germany where panel blocks of flats can be found filling older city blocks. And East Germans really pushed prefabrication to not churn out only a few panel types, but various unique designs fitting those specific conditions in that one place. One sign of postmodern architecture is, for example, the return to gable roofs. And while the panel systems were not able to do that, we can see those few panels here and there that do have an indication of such shape. Plus, of course, all the decorative elements hinting postmodernism even more. Such examples of blocks of flats filling inner cities can be found in other countries too. Uh, there is, for example, this little building from Hungary, which uh, clearly hints the older styles of architecture. This leads me to an example from Prague that illustrates all of these things that I mentioned already. In the 1970s, the Zhishkov district was not the best place to live in. Buildings were not touched in decades, younger people were encouraged to leave for the new estates in the outskirts, and some buildings were even starting to fall apart. It was not exactly a natural event, the place was purposefully left to rot, specifically banning any construction work in the area. But it was eventually decided to fully rework it, meaning complete demolition of tens of blocks, perhaps hundreds of buildings, and remodeling the street layout with a huge avenue right in the middle, of course. First demolitions started in 1980, and soon after, the public, locals, and various architects started to strongly oppose the idea. So it led to a clash of ideas which is just a perfect example of everything I summarized before. The political motivation for the rework was exactly to remove the unsuitable housing built in the evil past. People, however, argued, why not simply repair the buildings, restore them, and maybe upgrade them to fit those modern standards? Some architects apparently even did economic calculations to show it would be vastly cheaper. Politicians had none of it, since they saw concrete panel housing as the only way forward. It is also much easier to take PR pictures in front of new buildings. And the whole civil engineering sector simply did not have people or equipment to build brick houses anymore at such scale. People then argued, well, change that, decentralize the system, allow craftsmen or small businesses again to do what's needed. Don't plan the whole district as one megalomaniac modernist rework, but reuse classic city principles instead. But no, officials would not hear it, and on the contrary started to smear this opposition in media, branding them as troublemakers who question the need of the working class to have quality housing. Nevertheless, opposition to the rework was very strong, and some plans eventually did change to more favor the postmodern urbanism. Engineers designed, customized, a little more postmodern looking sections, also developed special corner sections to fit with the existing old structures and layout. Although the variations of buildings were nowhere near the German examples. The whole project was then cancelled in 1989, after reworking only a few blocks. Anyways, we need to wrap this up. Architecture and urbanism wanted to change. The modernist city expansions of the past two decades had flaws, and returning to some older urbanism had its benefits. The plain prefabrication also clearly wasn't suitable for city reworks, but arguably even the new estates anymore. However, the entire system was very reluctant to provide any change. Although we can see examples that doing things differently was possible, and it was working. Postmodern architecture was starting to appear, but in a much more modest form compared to the West. But as the political regimes started to crumble, we would see a massive jump in everything going into the 1990s. That will be a story for some other time though. Now, let's take a look at what I'm building here. All right, so in the time lapse, we are just in time for the second project. So let's first talk about that. Uh, as you can see, I'm just demolishing a couple of those old city blocks. The lore behind this place in Altengrad is exactly the same as what I was talking about in Prague, in Zhishkov district. So I'm kind of trying to replicate that scenario over here, although with different buildings and different, different settings, I guess. 
Unfortunately, in city skylines, I cannot really make buildings look weathered. Uh, they all look pretty much brand new, way too clean for this time period, that's for sure. So, you know, you might be wondering why am I destroying those old buildings and replacing them with this, because in the game they truly looked fine, right? There was no need to actually destroy them. But as I showed you those couple of pictures here in the introduction uh, from Prague, uh, that's not exactly the case in real life, or was not the case in real life. So, you know, as always, we kind of need to use our imagination a little in city skylines uh, for these kinds of things. Well, anyways, it's just a straightforward work. As you can see, I'm mostly trying to use uh, these prefabs. I'm using the uh, 80s prefabs, the German ones made by Meister Monis, mostly the 80s prefabs. And uh, I'm just trying to put them in some sort of 80s shapes. So these kinds of blocks, trying to play around with the geometry, making the corners more interesting, and these kinds of things. So it's definitely looking different compared to the 70s uh, places. Uh, I also extended or widened this main road, the one that has trams on it. It's just going to have the tram stop looking a bit better, but uh, as you can see, uh, it's a four-lane road, well, apart from the tram stop segment, but it's not really going to and from any four-lane road. So it's just, again, a little indication that, yeah, this project probably was uh, thinking of like a larger scale rework, but that eventually did not happen. So just like the scenario in Prague. Well, anyways, uh, otherwise detailing and this kind of work in here is pretty straightforward, as you can see. So let's talk about the first project that you could have seen in the time lapse. That was much larger scale. It was the redevelopment of that area between the botanical garden and, uh, you know, that new bridge place where we built in the 50s and 60s. So that place, uh, it only had from the 20s or 30s or, you know, in the city even earlier maybe, uh, some kind of I would even say slum area, some kind of really old uh, wooden houses as well. It was not exactly all that great, so it got completely redeveloped into some sort of new buildings. Uh, I put the Slovak radio building, of course, as the main landmark in there. It's, uh, you're gonna see that in the cinematics, it's actually visible really well from different parts of the city because it's kind of on a hill and the building is tall. Like I mentioned in the introduction, it's not the typical example of 1980s architecture, but I try to position it so that the surroundings kind of do look 80s. So there are the prefabs all around it, replacing the old buildings. And in the typical German fashion, I just try to blend it in with the existing city blocks and the old buildings from something like the 19th century. So I use the same heights, uh, kind of the same sizes, paid attention to the corners. So actually exactly what I'm doing over here with exactly the same buildings as well. Uh, the real life Slovak National Radio building is actually not just the pyramid, but it has all those different uh, like levels, yeah? So that's definitely hinting more towards some kind of uh, 60s design, with, and the building was designed in the 60s. So I tried also doing something like that there. So there are those different like commercial levels. The terrain was perfect for that. It's a very sloped area. So there's that slope going to that main avenue, as you are going to see in, um, in the cinematics later. It's actually a very, very nice rework, I guess. Uh, it's one of those places, you know, some places in the city I'm building so that I kind of like them in a way, you know, some sort of modernism that I would like to stay. Uh, some places in the city I'm not exactly doing uh, because I like them, but that particular place with the, with the radio headquarters I really do like it. I actually really do like it. It's, it's not like a massive change in that area, and that area was looking kind of bad. It's actually super similar to, to the place in Bratislava that uh, was there before the, the radio building. It was also not exactly looking all that great, and it had pretty much exactly the same buildings that used to be here in Altengrad before that, uh, that radio building was put there. And now we are going to build the TV tower. I'm going to be using the Vilnius TV tower from Lithuania, from Soviet Union back in the day. 
uh, because it's in the workshop. Architecturally, it fits the, the region, the time period, the broader time period. It's definitely not a typical example of 1980s architecture. Uh, it was finished in real life in uh, 78 or 79, something like that. But uh, you can clearly tell that it very heavily resembles the earlier designs, like for example, the Berlin TV tower or some Western towers as well. You know, the one in Munich, for example, the, in the Olympic Park and those kinds of single column designs with that like a single viewing area towards the top, plus some kind of spire for the transmitters and antenna and all those kinds of things. So it's definitely not like a very modern architecture for the 80s, but uh, well, it's, it's in the workshop, yeah? I, I'm not making these assets, so I need to work with what I have. Plus, it's kind of plausible, actually, because as I was explaining before, not everything done in the 80s must be 80s architecture. Uh, some designs simply were taken from some earlier periods and, uh, you know, buildings just took a long time to build. So perhaps in Altengrad there were some financial struggles and maybe the TV tower was already planned in the 70s or maybe even 60s and it was just now finished. And since I'm building a television tower and I was earlier talking about the Zhishkov district in Prague, I must show you the Zhishkov television tower. The tower was started, uh, the project was started in the 1980s, uh, mid-1980s, and it was actually finished after the revolution in the 90s. It kind of sort of became a little lightning rod for like general critique of the times, but uh, opinions kind of calmed down people. Some people hate it, some people love the building, but nevertheless, it's uh, one of the rarer examples of high-tech architecture, which is a branch of postmodernism. So, you know, you can clearly tell that it's a very technical looking structure. It's, uh, it's not concrete anymore. It has this very uh, steel looking coat. It is made of steel. I mean, the columns. It doesn't have a single column. It's the three columns. They are asymmetric. The viewing platforms are very pronounced and all of that. So it's completely something different compared to the Vilnius Tower over here, for example. But unfortunately, that's not in the workshop. If it was, then it would be a no-brainer. I would just slap it here very, very quickly. But anyways, that's just something that I wanted to mention. This project over here, as you can see, is uh, it's very straightforward. I'm just trying to, it's a sloped area. So I'm just trying to make uh, some kind of a plaza in front of this place. I'm kind of a little bit inspired by the Zhishkov television tower in Prague. Uh, it also has a little plaza down below. It's actually kind of like sunken. And uh, there are some different levels there with some other buildings around. So it's not just the spire, but you know, something happening on the ground where you can just uh, sit around. I think, I believe there's like a theater nowadays or something like that. So maybe that could be over here. Here I just created some sort of uh, little underground like shopping place or maybe some kind of like visitor center to the tower, you know, those kinds of things. Of course, a parking lot. And then I'm just going to wrap it up with some kind of nice tiles. This time I'm actually using a new technique. I'm detailing with intersection marking tools because I kind of had a very clunky shape in there. Plus I had lots of networks around. So those would obviously see the decals. Well, anyways, that's that. So let's return to the first project. And here we can see the before and after. Maybe actually go back here in that transition and take a look at some of the other blocks that are near the radio building, because there you're going to see how I filled some of the empty gaps left from the war still with the prefabs. So right now on the screen, that's the ones uh, towards the bottom in here. Uh, we also reworked over here that main avenue. It's not exactly the busiest road right now. Well, actually, it only has the bus going on it right now because past the botanical garden there on the top, it doesn't really go anywhere just yet. But maybe I'm going to change that in the, in the 90s. I'm going to just extend some kind of entrance to the city in this direction. It's kind of needed to, to happen. Uh, by the way, I'm kind of proud of this, uh, this tiling work down below because... I was able to actually make it exactly fit that those stairs going to the bottom levels. Uh, right, w right when I was first using those commercial buildings, the ones with the, with the cutout, I knew that I have to put them somewhere where I can just put stairs through that little place. So finally, I was able to do it. 
so you know the stairs are not going from the side of the of the, of the edge over there but they are just uh, past it so there can be like the uninterrupted wall now also i was heavily inspired by the real life place in bratislava which also uses these kinds of like uh, rust colored bricks well, they are not bricks they're like ceramic tiles but those are kind of typical even for the 90s architecture uh, sorry 80s architecture so even though the building is uh, 60s design with the rusted metal look it's uh, the plaza around it might be actually more typical for the later times and obviously those the urbanism of the prefabs around it that's definitely the 80s this is the transition for that uh, second place. Yeah, unfortunately, like I said before, the old buildings, they are kind of looking way too clean for this time period. I cannot really change that in city skylines. But here we are, here we have this uh, new the, this new district or these new blocks with the prefabs. They are noticeably lower density, as you can tell. They are not higher than the original buildings because in the 80s, the towers piercing the uniform height were not exactly done anymore. So I was just trying to use the same uh, same heights everywhere. And yeah, the place, is, the place is looking all right. Maybe not now. There are still some gaps left that were just not finished. The project, just like in real life Prague, was canceled in 89, most likely. And this place is going to continue evolving. The buildings will get refurbished, the areas will uh, just overgrow, you know, the trees will go larger. Perhaps we are going to do something about that uh, train depot there at the top. That's also going to be re refurbished going forward. And, you know, overall this place is definitely not going to stay the same. This is the television tower and, uh, yeah, it's big. It's very, very tall. Actually, the Zhishkov TV tower from Prague is like two-thirds of the height of the Vilnius tower. So uh, pretty much if you cut out or cut off the, the antenna from this one, that's the real-life height of, uh, of the tower in Prague. So that's kind of crazy. Here in Altengrad, obviously Altengrad is just a much smaller city, but it has much taller tower. Uh, it's fine. It's actually kind of looking nice from some different places, from like low angles, you know. If I'm going to do some kind of first-person tram rides, you're definitely going to see the tower from, from everywhere if you are looking in its direction. So that's going to be kind of nice. I actually prepared uh, this cinematic right here where I'm just going to show you uh, the, the, the skyline, I guess, of the city right now. Well, anyway, guys, that's going to be it for today's Altengrad. Thank you for watching it. If you liked it, then please, you know the drill. Do all the things below the video, clicking, writing, subscribing. And huge thanks to channel members who are directly supporting this channel and me in what I'm doing here. I greatly appreciate your guys' support. Thank you so much. Take care. Goodbye.